afternoon. I will just start with the introduction of this session uh, on writing of all omnivore parasites and predators. This is part of the overall approach to control the uh, fall army worm that is by using biological control. Next slide, please. Biological control, you know, I'm, I'm the director of the IPM Innovation Lab. It is a USAID funded project. I presented this slide in the earlier presentation, so I won't go into details of it. Uh, so IPM Innovation Lab works four countries in Asia and three countries in Africa. Next, next one, please. As I mentioned, in biological control, we have three groups. One is classical biological control. The other one is augmentative biological control. And third one is conservation biological control. We covered this topic also in the earlier webinars. So today's webinar will be concentrating different sections of the, mostly rearing of the uh, parasites and predators of the fall army worm. And next one, please. So in augmentative biological control, we already identified several natural enemies of fall army worm in Africa and Asia. Uh, to, next one, please. Of this, the Telnomus remus and Trichogramma species are the more uh, most effective parasites, egg parasites of the fall army worm. Here are some countries where the rearing programs are going on. Next one, please. Telnomus remus, as I mentioned, one of the very effective parasites. It was originally picked up uh, in Papua New Guinea and then distributed to different parts of the world. Next one, please. Here is a larval parasite, which Malik, Dr. Malik Ba will be talking about. And this larval parasite is also attacks other caterpillar pests. So it's called the Abrobrocon habitat and Dr. Malik Bai, as I mentioned, he will be covering. So next one, please. Uh, IPM Innovation Lab conducted two workshops on how to raise the parasites in 2019. We could not do that one in 2020 because of the coronavirus. Here's a picture of different participants in these workshops. Next one, please. Uh, these are some of the countries that participated. So we trained over about 40 candidates from 20 different countries. Next one, please. The approach that we have taken is we establish a nuclear center in the, in the capital of the country and then start satellite centers in different uh, provinces of the country and trying to really produce these parasites and release them throughout the country. That is the model that we are using for production and distribution of the parasites. Next one, please. So in general, augmentative biological control is a very safe one and is a very effective one. It could be combined with other tactics of the integrated pest management. And also the parasites and predators that we produce in the laboratories and release for augmentative control will also help in controlling pests of other crops. So it is a very effective one. And, uh, and now you will be hearing about rearing of trichogramma species, telnomus species on the eggs, uh, the eggs of the factitious hosts and then releasing in the field. And also he will be hearing about raising the larval pastor hebrubrocon habitat and releasing it. And finally, you will also hear about a predator how it is being produced in China and released in the field. So I welcome to this webinar. Thank you. Thank you so much, Moni. And I hear a little bit of noise just coming on the back there, but that was a great introduction. You did my job for me because you've introduced all the speakers as well, which is fantastic. Uh, and it's uh, my pleasure now to uh, invite our first presenter today, Dr. Tadali Tufura from the International Center of Insect Physiology and Ecology. Dr. Tufura is the country head for, for that organization in Ethiopia, and he's more than 15 years of experience in IPM education, research and development from national 
national and international institutions. Uh, and he served uh, as senior entomologist and IPM expert at CIMIT uh, in the past in CIMIT Nairobi. So uh, welcome to uh, Dr. Tafura. If you could, um, un oh, you're already there, I can see you. Uh, and I, I welcome you to the floor. Thank you, Alison. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, so I don't need to introduce myself, it's already done. Um, I'm actually going into my topic. Uh, my topic for today is mass reading psychogramma for field release to control for anwar. You hear me, yes? Hello? Yes, we can, we can hear you. Okay, next slide. All right, um, trichogramma reading um, has two components running in parallel. The first one is reading the factitious host, and the second one is um, reading trichogramma itself. Next. So I, I will start with um, the first part, which covers reading factitious host. Trichogramma can be mass read on Factitious host that allows for easy production, maximizing costs and efficiency and outputs. So uh, these factitious hosts can easily be read in the laboratory, uh, which are very less expensive as compared to the main host. So the common hosts that we currently using are um, mostly there are storage pieces, including Angois Grace Moss, Rice Mill Moss. Mediterranean floor moss. So these are the three species which are suitable to read um, trichogramma in laboratory as a factitious host because they are very easy to read in the laboratories. But for us, currently we are using um, Coisira cephalonica, which is rice me small for reading trichogramma, but three of them can be equally acceptable or can be used uh, for anyone who are interested in reading trichogramma. Next. All right, um, um, just a bit on the biology of uh, the rice meal moss or Coisera cephalonica, because we are using it for rearing uh, trichogramma. It can easily be collected from um, granaries, uh, cereal granaries, including rice or sorghum or maize uh, in any nearby storage areas. Um, looking at the biology of these insects, the female lays about, about 200 to 300. Um, eggs, and the eggs can last about three to four days before hatching, and the larva will take about 30 to 40 days, a bit longer. The pupal period about 10 to 12 days, and the adult can stay up to a week. So the total life cycle of this insect is about 45 to 55 days, depending on temperature and the relative humidity. Next. Um, we mostly rear Coisira cephalonica larvae on grains. They, they would like to feed on coarsely made maize grains or sorghum grains or any cereal grains. But uh, we need to sterilize the grains at 100 degrees Celsius for one hour before we release um, the insect. And this must be cooled down for about three to four hours before it is given to the insect. So once we have done that procedure of um, sterilization and cooling, then we sprinkle eggs on the milled grain, about one milligram of eggs for about three kilogram of grains in the bucket, as you can see in the picture below. So this will lead into hatching of the eggs in about three to four days, depending on temperature. So these are the buckets, the common buckets that we are using with holding capacity of about um, five to six um, kilograms of grains. But they must be perforated on the top so that they can give aeration for the insect. Next. Now, um, after we have sprinkled the eggs into uh, the milled grain, then um, after some time, after like um, um, 
40 to 50 days, uh, we need to go back and collect the adults because we are interested in the eggs of this insect. Then um, basically the adult moles lay their eggs on a nylon mesh inside of the position jar. The first one you see is of the position jar, it is a plastic jar laid with inside with nylon mesh, which is an of the position um, media for the adult moles. The adult moles lay their eggs in large numbers, mostly loosely. And then when we collect the insect, we put this oviposition jar into another cage. That is we call rectangular cage, because this helps us um, to avoid escaping of the moles when we open the lid of um, the oviposition jar. So that is how we collect the eggs from the oviposition jar. So the one at the seated corner in the petri dish are the eggs collected from um, Coisera cephalonica, and we usually collect eggs every 24 hours. Next. Okay, once we have collected the eggs, then the next step is egg sterilization. This is a very important step in rearing. That means um, a killing of the embryo of the eggs to avoid hatching. If the eggs are hatching, then um, we cannot use them for trichogram or anything. So we need to sterilize or kill the embryo uh, of the eggs. This helps to synchronize with trichogramma development. So um, killing of the eggs involves um, uveres in lamellar flow or uric chamber. So we present or we put the eggs in a petri dish inside a UV chamber. So we used uh, two options like 50 watt UV tube for 45 minutes, or if we have 30 watt UV tube, we can keep the egg for 10 minutes. But we need to uh, maintain a distance between the eggs and the, the, the UV tube because if we keep the eggs very much closer to the UV tube, then there could be desiccation of the egg. So we usually maintain about 12 to 50 centimeters between the eggs and the UV tube. Next, please. Yes, so the next step in rearing is that uh, once we have um, sterilized the eggs or killed the eggs, then we need to um, glue the eggs on special card called um, um, ivory board. So it's called trichocard or trichogramma card. So um, we cut um, this card, which is called um, a colored art paper card or ivory board, uh, which is marked with ruler and a pencil and cut with scissors into a required size. For us, we are using about 15 to 10 centimeter length and width of this paper for one time. So um, we apply glue, which is non-toxic one, on the card with camel hair brush. So we apply the glue with camel hair brush on the um, trico card. Once we apply that one, then we measure um, the X. And in our lab, we are using about one milligram of um, sterilized eggs, which is about between 35 to 40,000 eggs. So we use one third of these eggs for one trichocarpus. That means one third of one milligram of the eggs for trichocarpus. And then we uniformly sprinkle on the cap, as you can see on, on the right side, uh, the eggs being sprinkled or glued to the surface of the trichocard. So we keep the cut and we check it. If it is not falling, then it is fine. So uh, if some are falling, we shake it and then if some are falling from the cut, then we again re-sprinkle them onto the surface of the cut. Next, please. Now, um, this is the second part, which is trichogramma ready. Now we have kept the uh, factitious host eggs on the card. Then we are looking for trichogramma to expose to the card which has the eggs of the host. Then the next reading is about trichogramma. Currently we are working on two species. 
The first one is trichogramma clones, and the second one is trichogramma monzai. Next. Yeah, uh, trichogramma is, um, is a genus of um, a very small waspies, which is about less than one millimeter, that are uh, endoparasites of um, insects, very often lepidopterans, are the most widely used biological control agents in the world. At the moment, nine species of this insect being used in 30 countries worldwide. Trichogramma waspies are used to control many insect species of different crops, including cereals, vegetables, fruits, and orchards. Next, please. Yeah, the life cycle of trichogramma is that um, the adult was plays an egg within a recently laid host eggs. And uh, the mated females lay between 50 to 70 eggs in about three to five days. This is a very short-lived insect. The larvae then develops into the host insect. It is, it is the host embryo, and then causing the egg to turn black when they are maturing. The life cycle of um, this insect is very small. It ranges from seven to 10 days, depending on temperature. So uh, you can see uh, within this um, duration, it is possible to have many generations and this can be even more than their hostess. And the population can rapidly increase um, in a very short time because of their very short uh, life cycle. Next. Um, why we must with trichogramma? Uh, the reason is that uh, uh, the number of caterpillar eggs destroyed by native population of trichogramma is not sufficient to prevent the pest from reaching damaging levels because trichogramma occurs naturally in a small number. They are there in the ecosystem, but their numbers are very small so that they cannot suppress the pest. That's why we need to master it in the lab and use them for augmentative or in the data list in large numbers at one time. Next. Establishing trichogramma colony. Um, we usually initiate colony establishment by looking or having a survey or a scout. If, for example, we are ready for releasing to control for our one, then we scout four to six weeks old maize plants in the field. This is the right time where four armworms are laying their eggs on maize crops. So we examine X masses for parasitism using hand lenses. So we are examining full armworm X for any sign of parasitism by trichogramma in the field. Mostly uh, when the X are precised, they turn into deep black, as you can see, one of these picture below, compared to the one which are not precised. And also sometimes adult wasps or trichogramma can also be found nearby the precise eggs. So that is a good sign. Uh, once we make sure that there are some signs of parasitism of the host eggs or, for example, the fowl eggs, then we cut the leaves along with the eggs and put them into um, a, a plastic vial or a glass vial. Then we provide honey solution for the adults in case they emerge along the way. So we provide honey solutions um, for the adult waspies until we reach into the laboratory. Next, please. Yeah, um, remember uh, we have already prepared uh, trichocardis with um, eggs of factitious host. Now we have um, trichogramma collected from the field. So we need to expose them to each other. That means we need to expose uh, the trichocard with factitious host X with trichogramma waspis. So um, what we do is that uh, we will prepare a plastic jar, as you can see in this picture. So um, inside the plastic jar, there are two things. The first one is trichocard. Trichocard, you remember, we have already prepared it and we place inside the jar. And then um, honey solution, um, we paint 
we make a dilution of 50% honey solution and we paint this one on a paper sheet and then we glue the paper sheet inside the plastic jar, especially on the inner side of um, the plastic jar with masking tape. Then we introduce uh, trichocardis into the um, plastic jar. And then um, by this, then um, the trichogramma waspis will be released or exposed with trichocardis, which has the eggs of uh, the factitious hogs. Quickly, the trichogramma waspis, they look around and they start of depositing their eggs on the factitious host eggs. And we're currently using about um, one wasp in the ratio of 20 eggs. And we expose this one for about 24 hours. Then we repeat another cycle until the wasp uh, dies, like they die within three to four days. Next. Yeah, um, you can see eggs when they are precised by trichogramma. Uh, initially, they are like creamy, and then they turn into uh, gel after three to four days, showing uh, rates of vaticism. So this happens into like three to four days. Um, then these precise eggs, which might have um, pica of um, trichogramma or larval stage of trichogramma, we can, we can release them immediately into the field if it is ready, or we can keep them in the refrigerator for later uses. But it's not advisable to keep them longer in refrigerator, but they can be kept for a few days if you desire to use um, uh, shortly after storage. So um, um, it's possible to keep them for a few days in refrigerator as once it's ready. Next, please. So um, in the augmentative field release, um, before releasing into the field, um, we check for post X on plantains. For example, if you would like to release to control the fall armyworm, then we have to make sure that fall armyworms have already a, I mean, laid X on maize plant. So we need to go for the scouting and the check for X of the host plants on the target uh, crops. So uh, once we are sure that um, eggs have already been laid on our desired crops, then uh, we ship or we deploy the trichocard. As you can see, trichocard uh, has paper envelope. So we put trichocard inside a paper envelope to give protection for trichocard. The trichocard has already um, trichogramma inside host eggs before they hatch. So we need to give some protection to it. So what we do is um, we place trichocard inside a paper envelope and then we hang them or staple them to um, a crop. For example, like as you can see from this picture, we are using make mess and we hang the envelope onto the mess leaves. So the cabbage should be stapled in the morning house. Uh, very often it's advisable to release trichogramma in the field, either very early in the morning or late in the afternoon to avoid um, maybe if the temperature is hot because they are coming from the lab so that uh, it gives them some time for adjusting their service. And also uh, there are also predations. Predators also, um, predate on the eggs so that it's good to avoid them. Therefore, we use, we prefer morning hours before 9 a.m. or so. Um, currently, what we are practicing is we release about um, 150,000 to about 200,000 200, um, eggs of trichogramma, I mean, the eggs of the um, factitious host, which has trichogramma per hectare, and this could be done in a weekly interval. So uh, this can take about five to six times um, for a season, especially for maize. So for maize, we start releasing around when maize is about three to four weeks old, and then we continue releasing up to when 
maize is about reflowering when it's reached about eight to nine weeks. So that requires a huge number of insects and we need to keep on rearing in the lab. Therefore, um, when we are rearing in the lab, we usually um, go to the field and bring new population of trichogloma to avoid inbreeding because when we continuously raise them in the lab, they become very weak. So um, frequently we go to the field, bring field population of trichogloma and mix them with laboratory population to regain their strengths. So uh, when we are applying, if we are planning to apply trichogloma, uh, we need to avoid application of pesticides because uh, that can also kill trichogloma uh, in the field. So if we are planning to release trichogloma, for example, in maize field, we need to give time for the trichogloma to act. Therefore, we have to avoid using pesticides. Next. So my next uh, slide is on um, some of our trials from uh, Kenya. Um, um, we have released uh, trichogramma into the field, and this is as the results we obtained. So um, in the top left, as you can see, um, uh, four lagoon egg, egg masses. Uh, we started collecting on our releasing days. You can see I started on 9, 3, 20, 20, 19. And then, um, the moment we release trichogramma, we collect the egg masses and they take them to the lab from both treated and the controlled crops. And then um, we see if those eggs are precised by trichogramma or not. So as you can see um, uh, from the start all the way up to um, the last sampling date, in treated plot, egg practicism was high initially and then reduced due to the activity of the parasites. So um, uh, as you can see in treated plot, the rate of egg parasitism is um, um, increased and then the number of egg masses sharply reduced. Now, this has already been translated into leaf damage, as you can see in the lower picture, I mean figure, which shows um, leaf damage scale because um, the role of trichogramma is to destroy the eggs before the larval state reached into the extractive state. So it's a sort of preventive control. Therefore, um, leaf damage is caused by um, the foraminorm larvae. In, in, in a treated plot, the leaf damage has sharply reduced uh, starting from the first day sampling all the way up to the last day sampling leading into protection of the mess uh, crop. Next. Okay, that's all I have. Um, thank you. Excellent, thank you so much. That was a, um, a very um, detailed and very interesting presentation. Uh, and I know that we've got um, lots of questions uh, for you that we'll actually ask for this session as well, and there's more coming. So um, just a couple of uh, maybe quick questions around the, the cost and the ability to scale up uh, these sorts of laboratories. What, what in your opinion, um, uh, Dr. Tafera, do you think is the cost to set up a basic rearing facility like this for trichogramma? Okay, um, thank you, Alison. Um, we have not done cost benefit analysis uh, with the formal cost benefit analysis so far, which involves this um, economists. Um, but uh, our perception is that um, uh, the cost looks affordable, especially if it is applied for large scale ones. Probably um, maybe the cost is a bit challenging for small scale applications. However, for large scale applications, um, it, the, the cost is mainly about the cost of the grants for rearing the factitious host. Okay. Um, uh, that will not take much because um, you can collect those grants also from um, uh, granaries when they are dumping some of the grants, we can collect them mm -hmm. um, and they use for the insect rearing. So uh, the main cost goes to uh, the cost of the grains. Otherwise, collection of the insect is one-time collection. Just go as scout and collect the insect bring to the lab and, and, and the rare thing. But of course, uh, we are talking of unestablished laboratories. So um, establishing a laboratory is a different story uh, because as you know, 
it requires space, it requires a trained uh, manpower and so on. But once you have those in place, the facilities are already there, but um, rearing and rearing the insect is not that expensive. If we are using factitious host, that's why we are using factitious host because they are very easy as well as uh, they are affordable to raise them. But if you are using the actual host, like for example, fallout worm eggs, it's a bit expensive because we need to rear also fallout worm on artificial diet. And it goes for the cost of artificial diet to rear uh, fallout worm as well. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, great. Thank you. That's a, that's a very good answer. Um, and I, I've got another question here. I mean, you talked about the fictitious host. I, I think you were talking about that you were using the rice meal moth, I, I, I believe. Uh, you mentioned two others. I mean, is there any um, difference between the success rates of the different fictitious hosts? I mean, why did you choose that one? Just because it was the most available or it is the most successful? Yeah, um, the three can be used to raise this parasite, but the reason we used um, uh, the meal moss is that um, we found it nearby rice uh, storage granules in our locations. So uh, that is why, why we chose um, the, the, I mean, Coisira cephalonica. And to some extent also, it has bigger eggs as compared to the other two. Yeah. And uh, we perceive that this parasite prefers uh, relatively bigger eggs as compared to the other two. So that's why we are interested to use uh, Coisira cephalonica. Okay, great. Um, here's a question. Uh, I'd like to know how to count leaf damage. On Is it a one to nine scale or how do you count leaf damage? Yeah, I think you already answered that um, the leaf damage the scoring scale is initially developed by Davis, like in um, 1980 or 90s, sometimes back. So we adopted the same, the same um, scale in our measuring. So there are descriptions one to nine. So when one, there is no damage. When there is two, two means maybe one or three um, leaf damage. Nine means a complete devastation of the plant. So it's a subjective, but uh, for a trend eyes, it is, it is okay to, to use it. So uh, we adopted from uh, Davis 1989. Great. Uh, here's another question. Is there any possibility to have sustainable population of trichogramma in the field, maybe after a few times of mass release? Right, um, um, that's a good question. It also depends on the, the, uh, the cropping system. Um, maybe it's good to mention the, uh, some of the factors which hinders the, um, the, effect, the efficacy of trichogramma is important. One is also um, um, if, if, if it is a complex agroecosystem, if it is a complex cropping system, um, it may also hinder trichogramma Post locations, so that uh, it reduces maybe rates of plasticism. So I think uh, uh, most literature agrees that uh, it's good to release like grammar in, in, in genetically uniform uh, plantations or when there is one crop, it's much better because it hinders them. So that's, that goes with sustainability. So if we release um, in, in uh, maize plants, then it is easy for trichogramma to locate host eggs and then build up their population uh, and increase the population and then sustain themselves. The other factor is also rain is another factor. So um, we have noticed that um, after we have applied trichogramma, if there are rain, I mean heavy rainfalls, it washes away everything. Okay. So that also contributes into sustainability. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Um, here's a question from Evelyn. Hi, uh, in the on-farm evaluation of trichogramma against fall armyworm, how far or what is the distance between the treated and untreated plots? All right, um, in our case, uh, we used uh, quite a distance, maybe like uh, about one kilometer or so. So we have, we have scattered our plots um, with uh, different uh, farmers. Therefore, they are not uh, adjacent to each other because uh, of, I mean, the micro trichogramma can fly into um, 
adjacent farm. So for a boys that we used um, about in one kilo, kilometer range of farms that we use in our tribes. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, that, that was excellent. Your, your answers were also very um, detailed. And um, Dr. Tafara, we've actually got quite a few written questions um, coming in. If after your presentation, you could um, jump on the Q&A uh, box and answer some of those. Some of those are quite detailed questions. Um, we would really appreciate that. And we, and we very much appreciate you joining us um, from from uh, the middle of the night, uh, I think, or early morning. Um, it's been fantastic to have you. Um, so thank you very much for your presentation. And before I just leave this uh, presentation, I'm just going to ask Mooney, if you could just unmute yourself. Um, thank you, Dr. Tadali. Uh, thank you, <laughs> um, Mooney, I think you had a question there you wanted to answer live. It says, in this, t uh, with these two trichogramma species, which one is the most effective for farmers? You know, I've been typing the answer for that question. Trichogramma proteosum is one of the effective ones. And also very recently, Dr. Tadali and his group found trichogramma wanjai in Tanzania and Kenya to be very effective, giving about 60, 70% parasitism of fall amoebom eggs. Trichogramma kylonis has given different, you know, different parasitism rates in different countries. Some countries it is very effective. Some countries it is giving somewhat uh, less uh, parasitization on uh, fall armyworm eggs. So we we have to evaluate in each country the local parasites so of the local species of the trichogramma and see which one is giving good uh, parasitism of fall armyworm. So, so far, trichogramma proteosum, trichogramma wanzai uh, seem to be doing very well in addition to trichogramma kylonis. Excellent, thank you. Thank you very much for that. Uh, and um, I can see um, there's quite a few people uh, busy amongst our experts on the Q&A. So keep your questions coming in. If you have uh, any questions, here's your chance to um, ask the experts. So I really encourage you to um, keep writing your Q&As uh, into the, um, into that Q&A box. Uh, I'd now like to um, invite our second uh, expert, and I think I've got this round the wrong way. I'm very sorry. Um, oh, no, that was the Q&A session. There we go. No, I haven't. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Malik Barr uh, from ICRISAT, uh, and it's, uh, he has many years of research and expertise relating to uh, IPM uh, and also um, this topic, the rearing of parasitoids and predators for fall army worm control and he is going to be um, talking to us today about uh, the mass rearing of Telenormus rumus and the Habrobrachon hebitor. I don't know if I pronounced that right but I'm sure Malik is going to <laughs> improve uh, my pronunciation. So welcome. Thank you Alison and, and uh, good morning and good afternoon to everyone depending on your time zone. So uh, yeah, you you the Abu Balkan Ebeto, that's the name of the species. So I'm going to cover the mass rearing of uh, Telonomus remus and Abu Balkan Ebeto, and how they can be used in biological control of the fall amyon. So next slide, please. So as uh, mentioned by Munini's uh, introductory presentation, Telonomus remus is a uh, neck parasite of uh, different uh, Lepidopteran species, which was uh, first described in the Malaysia Peninsula. So it was uh, introduced against uh, different uh, Spodoptera species to different parts of the world, including India and Israel, the Caribbean, Florida, New Zealand, Australia, and Venezuela. So in Africa, it was uh, first described from specimen collected in Kenya in the 80s. And uh, recently, everywhere in Africa, the parasite was uh, found uh, parasitizing uh, the fall armyworm. And it is uh, well known in the Americas where it's also used in the biological control programs. So the parasite is also available, of course, in Asia. This is the, it's actually center of origin and many places in Africa. Next slide, please. So, 
So Telonomus remus also is a tiny pathway species and it's measured 0.5 to one millimeter in length and the body is a uh, shiny black. The females, they have a filiform antenna and short abdomen. The male, sorry, the male, they have a filiform antenna and short abdomen. While female have a uh, four segmented uh, clapped antenna and long and wider abdomen. Next, please. This cycle of the parasoids is uh, completed inside the host egg. So it's an endoparasoid and it can be divided like uh, for many other insects uh, into eggs, larvae and pupa. And the mean development period range from 10 to 13 days in different hosts, depending on your rearing conditions. And optimum condition for rearing are 27 degrees and the relative humidity of uh, 75%. In uh, our rearing conditions, each uh, female of uh, Telonomus remus can produce about uh, 270 eggs and during its uh, productive uh, lifespan. And uh, we were able to rear Telonomus remus. And uh, in our case, the female have a lifespan that lasted about uh, 15 to 20 days. Next slide, please. So in the Q&A of my colleague uh, presentation of Tadele presentation, there was some question about the effectiveness of some Tychogamma species, especially the colleague from, there was one guy from Vietnam who asked that question. So with this slide, I can help answer that question. You have many Tychogamma species that can be recorded on uh, fall armyworm eggs, but not all of them are effective. And this uh, graph gives you a clear example of why some trichogramma species are not effective. It's mainly because of the scales that cover the egg masses of, uh, trico, of uh, the fall armyworm. That, this one is, this uh, slide is, a, is based on a, an experiment that we conducted uh, in our laboratory here in Niger. So you can see that uh, Telonomus remus was able, is able to parasite fully covered egg masses and of course uncovered egg masses. And when you compare it to Trichogamma, you can see Trichogamma was not able to, to pass the, the scale barriers that cover the egg masses. So that is one of the reasons why some of the Trichogamma species are not effective. So then when you have your Trichogamma species, you want to make sure that it's effective. You have to test it in the laboratory before moving on to the field. So this uh, this uh, slide is based on a paper that we published uh, in 2020. Next slide, please. So as uh, presented in the case of telonomy of uh, trichogramma, for mass culture of your egg parasite, so you need to get your the host first. And in our case, we use a uh, fall armyworm for mass rearing telonomus remus. So as uh, mentioned by Tadili, mass rearing of uh, Spodoptera fugipeda can be quite uh, expensive if you rely on artificial diet, of course. But in our case, we use uh, alternate host for it. We don't use artificial diet for mass rearing of uh, Spodoptera fugipeda. We use uh, the leaves of uh, castor bean. So we do have a castor bean uh, that we planted uh, uh, nearby our laboratory. So then those are permanent plants and you can collect leaves every morning if you want for mass culture of your fall armyworm. So then we use castor leaves for mass culturing fall armyworm. And then when you have your fall armyworm X, a culture that is established, and then you use the eggs of the fall armyworm to mass culture your telonomus remus. And as uh, indicated for trichogamma, the egg masses needs to be irradiated. That's uh, halt, uh, the development of the, the, the eggs. 
and and also avoid the cannibalization of eggs because if you don't you add the eggs emerging um, a first instance larvae will come out and eats some of the parasites eggs so for this reason you need to irradiate your eggs and allow them to be parasitized by telonomous remains. So then you can see here pictures of the cage in which um, the mouths of uh, Spodoptera fugitivator are being reared. And here you have uh, egg masses that have been collected from the egg laying cage. So we just collect the eggs from the leaves because they are they lay eggs on the leaves and then we collect the, we just cut the leaves from the plant and then the egg masses that are on the leaf are then glued on a sheet of uh, paper. A cut, a, a, those are the same cards that uh, the colleagues refer to when uh, addressing the trichogamma mass rearing. Next, please. So here also you need to put some droplets of uh, honey. And you can see here on the right sides, uh, on the top of the cards here, you can see black spots here. Those are actually droplets of honey that have been placed on the corner of the cards to allow the adults when they emerge to feed on it before being collected. So, and uh, egg masses are into, into plastic uh, flasks. You can see a picture at the bottom here, on the right bottom. And together with uh, eggs that have been previously parasite by telonomous remiss. That's for the colony establishments. So, of course, to start your telonomous remiss culture, you need to get your white insects from parasite eggs in the field. And you, when you collect them, you incubate them. And then when you get your emerging adult, then you can start your culture with them. And the parasite eggs are, the, the adults, uh, I mean, the tubes are incubated for 24 hours with the, with the parasites. Next, please. So then, as I said, the egg cars are exposed for two days to the mated T telonomy service females. And we use a ratio of 20 eggs for one uh, female. So you can see, I don't know if the picture is uh, clear enough on the right side, the top right side, you can see a female of uh, telonomy service that is uh, exploring the eggs masses for laying its, uh, its uh, own eggs. And uh, when you use, uh, if I mean, when you put your females uh, with the egg masses for two days, so the same females, you can move them to another flask and uh, give them another set of eggs. So then every two days, you can get another set of eggs being given to the, to the female to parasitize. And when your telonomous remiss culture is established, the easiest way to parasite the X cat is just to introduce one cat that is already parasitized in which the adults are about to emerge and you put them in the in contact with a fresh prepared a cats with a unparasitized X and then you will get a new parasitation. Next please. So then, uh, as I said, uh, yes, when you use this uh, technique using the cards that is already parasitized, so you can use, you can move that uh, cards every two days to a new, to another flask with freshly prepared eggs. And about three to four days after parasite exposure, you, the parasite eggs becomes dark. So you can see here, the on the bottom here, the eggs that have been parasites, so that they turn black uh, compared to the freshly laid eggs, which are creamy. So that's a way for you to check whether your eggs have been parasites or not. Next, please. So telenomous remiss can also be mass culture on eggs of uh, Coursera cephalonica using the method described by Tadele on Tychogamma. I have not 
personally started the culture of fraudulent misery on Costa Rica, Costa Rica, but they are in the literature, the folks in Brazil were able to do that. And they use the same technique as the one uh, uh, we use for Taiko Gamma. So then uh, the egg um, of uh, Coursera are plus onto CAS and we use Telodomus Remus and they are allowed to be parasite for 24 hours. But at the beginning, the parasitism is uh, quite uh, low. So it takes some generation for the parasites to get used to the eggs of Coursera and then to reach the 100% uh, parasitism. Telonomy, I mean, uh, telonomy service used also to be read by the colleague at Bangalore in the 80s in India on Corsara Cephalonica. So there was a lot of literature on that in the past. But uh, recently, I'm not aware of anyone who is doing that apart from the guys from, uh, from Brazil I refer to. So you can see here a picture that I brought from Vakari with telonomy service on the eggs of Corsara Cephalonica. This, uh, I mean, if you manage to do that, that will be, of course, a less expensive than using the the eggs of uh, the horse itself. Next, please. So, for your mass culture of telonomy service, it is advised to introduce a wild telonomy service uh, quite often in your uh, colony to maintain vigor. So, same as the one from. Gamma. and but before introducing new cameras, you have to quarantine them to make sure that you are not bringing uh, any disease in your colony. And you also need to make sure that your culture of polyamorum is conducted in a different room to avoid any contamination. Because if you get your telenomics famous in your polyamorum culture, then you will decimate your your colony. You, so for this reason, make sure to have rooms that are separate and, and uh, have a, I mean, a stringent measure for avoiding any telenomic service to get in your full army home culture. It is also important to make sure that your asepsis condition are well uh, maintained to avoid any disease that to also collapse your colony. And when you have your culture of telonomy service, and that applies to every past suite, so you have to control the quality quite often. So just uh, take a batch of egg masses and give them the parasite to parasite and check the percentage of parasitism, percentage of emergence, and the sex ratio to make sure that you still have the same parameter in your culture. Otherwise, you will be surprised by the outcome. Next, please. So for the release of uh, telonomy service, we also use uh, parasite scars that we put in envelopes. So this is, those are pictures from experiments that we conducted in Niger. So when we release the parasite at the, at the rate of 15 telonomy service for 100 follow X based on the literature. And telonomy service has been used on a large scale in many countries in the Americas, especially Venezuela and other countries also in the Americas. And it's a very good uh, pathways and it works very well against the full amount. Next, please. So you can see here a picture. I mean, this graph presents you the, the field experiments that we conducted in Niger. So you can see the parasitism of telonomous famous in the field where you release the parasite as compared to the field where we didn't release the parasite. Since the parasite is occurring naturally, that's why we have a certain level of parasite in the control field. But when you release the parasite, you can see here the difference. So above 60% parasites in the field where we release the uh, telonomous famous compared to less than uh, 15%, let's say 7% on the control field. So telonomy series is effective against the full army one. Next, please. So my next topic is about is on the abovacone beta. 
So this is a new uh, possibility that we want to explore. And why our volcano beta? It's a well-known uh, lava pathway. It's a uh, polyphagous. It is a uh, it is uh, a parasite of many Lepidoptera species, which develop on our store products uh, a, like a Plodia, Ephesia, Corsara, Cetutoga, Galeria. And also, it is a, a parasite of uh, field insect pests like uh, Helicoverpa majora, some Swodoptera species, and many other species like uh, Ectomiolis, Palpita, and the Millet Head Miner, Elocalis, Alubipentula. Next, please. And Abubako Nebeto has been used in augmentative release against the millet head miner. That's the picture here on the top right. And it has also been used against the carob moth, especially in the in Iran and other places on to control the carob moth on home granites. And uh, it is also used against uh, helicopter palmigera on tomato, and also against the T. Luca in India. Next, please. So, for to, to get the culture of uh, Aboba Konebeto, you, you need to use a factitious horse. And uh, in our case, we use the eggs in uh, the larvae of uh, Corsara cephalonica, the rice moth. So, but you can also use um, other alternate horse like, like uh, Mediterranean moth. Uh, Ephesia and other store product insects. And in our case, we routinely rear the Corsara cephalonica on grains of permulet at uh, ambient temperature. So, in our case, the temperature range between 26 and 30 degrees. And we use a mixture of uh, millet grain and millet flour. And we introduce them in cases. You can see here the design of the cages that we have in our case at the top right here. And we inoculate the cages with approximately 3,000 uh, Coisara cephalonica eggs to start the culture. And usually adults emerge after one month. So you can see here some buckets here full of uh, Coisara cephalonica. In the middle here, those are mouths of the full of, uh, of Coisara cephalonica that are being put in this uh, box to collect the eggs. That's the egg laying box. Next, please. To establish the culture of uh, Abobacon Ebeto, we use third and uh, fourth insta larvae of the rice moth. So, and for this purpose, we use a ratio of uh, 25 uh, larvae for two females of uh, Habobacon Ebeto, and we let them to be parasite for 24 hours. So then you can see here on the top here, those are cutted pillars of the, of Coursera cephalonica being parasitized by the Habobacon Ebeto. And in the middle picture, the mid picture that is in the middle here, you can see those are Abubakan Ebeto that started emerging from parasite X. And usually after seven to 14 days, you get you, the, your new colony, I mean, your new generation will start emerging. So why, that's the reason why Abubakan Ebeto is interesting because it is easy to mass culture and it multiply quite uh, uh, fastly and uh, it is polyphagous, as I said. Next, please. So then we started uh, testing uh, Abubakon and Ebeto against the fall armyworm, and we noticed that Abubakon Ebeto can complete its development on uh, so some of the larvae of Spodopteras frigipeda. So you can see at the top right here, a female of uh, Habubakan Ebeto that is on to 
the caterpillar of uh, fall armyworm trying to lay eggs. But the challenge with Abu Bakr Beto as compared to his uh, preferred also Coursera cephalonica, it does not produce much progenies on fall armyworms. But there was a study recently in India by Sri Lata et al. in 2019 that showed that Abu Bakr is a, a vector, is a, an effective parasite of uh, Spodoptera frigipeda. So then that's how did the uh, Abu Bakr inhibitor can be used against the fall armyworm? So you can see here in this picture at the top right here, you can see a female of uh, Abu Bakr inhibitor that has laid eggs. You can see the white uh, spot here on the caterpillar. Those are eggs of uh, Abu Bakr inhibitor that has been laid on the caterpillar. But before parasitizing, the caterpillar, the good thing with Abu Bakr Ebetor, it has feet on caterpillars. So then it first sting the caterpillar, inject venom, which will lead definitively to the death of that caterpillar. Even though it doesn't lay eggs on that caterpillar, that caterpillar will be killed. In our case, Abu Bakr Ebeto was able to parasitize, so that it was after killing the caterpillar, it was able to lay eggs on stage fifth and sixth of the caterpillar. So apart from parasitizing those uh, uh, stages, Abu Bakr Ebeto could be used in augmentative release and to work as an insecticide. It will definitively get in the feed and it will kill the caterpillars. So you can see here the bottom, the picture at the bottom here. Those are a cocoon of Abu Bakr that are about to emerge from the caterpillars, the dead caterpillars that were parasitized. So however, we need to continue exploring this uh, a, a possibility and see how it can be used. But definitively Abu Bakr inhibitor, because it is easy to mass culture, easy to establish the culture. Everyone can try testing it against the full armyworm and it might be easy to use it. And as I said, it will also work as a kind of insecticide in case it doesn't develop, produce enough progenies, it can still kill the, the parasoid, uh, the caterpillars. Next, please. I think that's my last slide if i remember well so with that i will uh, thank you all for attending so those are a couple of papers that we publish on the different topics that i covered and so feel free to go on the web and see if to have access to them in case you don't have access just email me i will be glad to share with you so thank you very much for listening Thank you so much, uh, Malik, um, Dr. Barr. That was um, extremely interesting again, uh, lots of detail. And I really liked the, the looking at the two uh, parasitoids as well. It sort of gave um, quite a sort of um, different perspective. Um, a couple of questions, actually quite a few questions are coming through. Uh, and here is one from Ravi Joshi. Do you experience any super parasitism of eggs in Telenomus rumus? I haven't personally experienced that, but that will definitely occur in case you don't use the right ratio. Okay, if you put more uh, parasites, I mean, if the ratio, the ratio parasites to horse is not good you have not enough hosts for the parasite to parasite, of course, you can experience that. Okay, excellent. Here's another question. In the graph, the difference between the Telenormus rumus and the trichogramma, um, I think this person's asking, the cost when we rear Telenormus rumus is maybe more than when we rear trichogramma. Is this right? Yeah, it is. It, it will depend on what uh, substrate you use for your the mass culture of fall armyworm. In my case, I'm not sure that is a, it 
it is more costly to hear telonomy ceremonies than tachogamma because I don't use artificial death for mass culturing fall armyworm. But if you are using artificial death for mass culturing fall armyworm, of course, telonomy ceremonies production will be more expensive. Okay. And here's another question. Can we rear Telonomus rumus with grains like wheat or bajra? I haven't experienced that. I am not aware of anything like that in the literature. Okay, here's, here's a question here. Can we mass multiply Telonomus rumus on spot diptera natura eggs? That's one also, according to the literature, it is feasible. I have not tried myself, but according to the literature, it is feasible because they, they first in India in the, if I remember well, up to the 90s, they were doing a culture of telonomous remus and they were using spodoptera. Okay, excellent. Um, here's a question for the Harbour Bracon rearing. What kind of parasitism cage is more possible? And you mentioned only a plate, I think. Does that make sense? Parasitism cage for abobacon. From in my case, abobacon, I just uh, put them the caterpillars in uh, petri dishes and I let them be parasitized by the parasites. It's okay. in petri dishes. Okay, excellent. H how how do you treat the temperature? Wait a minute, my questions just disappeared. How do you treat the temperature before you release in the field? Hmm. I'm not getting the point. Can you? No, I'm not quite sure. The, the question's not quite clear. If you've asked that question, you, you may just need to rewrite it just a little bit more clear. Um, I've got another question for you. Um, when you release these parasitoids in the, uh, in the field, um, what's, what do you have to be careful with with the use of pesticides? Do you not use pesticides at all? Or do you have... Uh, a certain amount of days when you can use pesticides or certain types of pesticides. What's your advice on that? Yeah, I've been, uh, Tadili already mentioned that and parasites and pesticides are not good friends. <laughs> so <laughs> we should avoid having pesticide while using the parasites. So then depending on what uh, the, the, the molecule, the ingredient you are using, so you have to see what the the, what they put in the label of that uh, insecticide to see what is the number of days after which you can release parasites. So anyway, okay. for me, it's not good to use uh, both together, but you should make sure that you put enough days between them to avoid any... Okay. I mean, Just, uh, here's another question. I guess it's a, it's a more broader question, but it would be useful to have your, uh, your opinion. I mean, do you think... Uh, is, is this commercially viable? Is there, is there any way to make this type of biological control commercially viable in, in your opinion? I, I think that is viable. It's possible because we, here in Niger, there is a good example about the millet head miner. And we even published one paper on that, how the past trade can be commercialized. And we even pilot study the commercialization of past trades. And we train some farm cooperatives they establish culture of the different uh, insects. And every year, few of them are able to produce the parasites and to sell them to their fellow farmers. So we have a good model here in Niger that is working yeah. on the millet head miner. So this is the kind of model that we think we can try in other places. But for that to be possible, you need to get a centralized place like the model that uh, Muni presented where yes. Farmers cooperative can be backed in case they have any issue with their own uh, their, their culture. Yeah. Excellent. Good answer. And I think we've got a session coming up later in the six month series on on this sort of aspect. So it'll be good to share that model, I think, uh, at that point and talk about how it could be commercially viable and how you can use, um, you know, uh, farmer groups and, and cooperatives as well. One more question, and this is the last. Um, when you hand, when you you um, put the parasites, parasites, sorry, parasitoid, parasitized egg cards on the maize plant, is there any damage, or could there be damage by rain, etc.? And how do you prevent such damage? 
Yeah, of course it can be damaged by rain. So then you have to, um, to check the forecast before deciding the day where you have to release your parasite. And, but usually we put also in the envelope, the envelope uh, somehow can help, but not if it's a heavy rain, it won't help. Okay. But definitely you have to check the weather. Okay, good tip. And actually I'm gonna ask you one last question. Um, is there an instance that these parasitoids can become invasive species later? And do they have any impact on any other native species? I don't think so. I'm not aware of any such cases in the literature. And uh, maybe Muni can share his experience on this, but to the best of my knowledge, no. Excellent. Okay, thank but you. I will, I, I will suggest that Muni also weigh on this if he has something to say. <laughs> okay, well, we might we might have a bit of time to talk about that question at the end because that, that's a question that's often asked. Um, thank you so much, Malik, um, Dr. Barr. That was uh, really a pleasure to have you uh, as part of this series and, and a great presentation with lots of good examples and tips uh, for many of our um, participants in this session who are watching today and who will be watching later on the recorded version. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye. Uh, and now I would like to introduce our last uh, speaker uh, for today, uh, Mingqing Wong uh, from the Institute of Plant Protection, uh, Chinese Academy of Agricultural Sciences. Uh, and Dr. Wong works at the USDA uh, ARS Sino-American Biological Control Laboratory uh, at the Institute of Plant Protection. Uh, within CAS and today she is presenting on rearing of the pentatumid predator Arma chinensis uh, and um, Dr. Wong it, are you uh, with us could you join us now? Hello. Can Welcome. You, yes can I can you? hear you. I can hear you very well. Oh thank you. Thank you. It's my turn. Hello good everyone. Good morning. Here is Meng Qin Wang from Peking. I'm from the Institute of the Plant Protection, Chinese Academy of Agriculture Science. I will share with you my group research on the sting bug. I'm Chinese and our work against the divided FAW through Yunnan province the two years. In fact, uh, it should be my boss, Dr. Li Shenzhang, he should be here and give the presentation for the meeting, but, but he's not today. You know, we are in the busy time of the year. For you, it's the beginning, it's the beginning of the new year, but by Chinese calendar, we are in the end of the 2020. So everyone is busy. I have to say sorry for, from her for his absences. Thank you. As a, Past biological control group. Our research next. Next, thank you. Yeah. Our research aimed to collect and evaluate the natural enemy insects. And then we need to study the artificial rearing technology and the control effect of this natural enemy insects, uh, both in protected fields and open fields. Next. In fact, face to the for army warmer, um, our first question is, we don't know whether or not is there any natural enemy for controlling the hungry warmer in Chinese mainland. In fact, we don't know. So next. So the first step means to get more information of the, we need to know how many natural enemy insects for the for army warmer? Of course, we know we have we should have many, but we don't know what's this. So the first step is exploration in the in the field. Mm -hmm. We just uh, the first uh, work is we checked almost ten thousand papers published uh, the last uh, one hundred years. Uh, and we got good news. More than more than twenty two hundred and forty natural enemy insects were reported. Uh, you see, at that time, we get the confidence. Soon, we get track of seventy natural enemy insects in China. 
including thoughtful predators such as stink bugs, pentatibi, and other predators. Of all the insects, more than 60% predators are bugs and beetles. No way. Next, thank you. No, we got a list of possible. So the next uh, step means we need to get more information of the natural enemy insects. And uh, we need to how to select and uh, evaluate the natural enemy insects. Of course, mass massive rearing is the, is the top. Mm, of course, it's not easy. So next, thank you. Are the 2019 with almost uh, everybody spent in the field. We spent the whole year in the field survey and collecting. And we found two sting bugs and many beetles in the field. And the sting bugs, which mm, seems uh, they always appear in the field almost, are almost the same time and same location in Yunnan province. This uh, gave us much confidence. Mm, next, thank you. Yeah, the one species is arm Chinese and another species is uh, Mm -hmm. Especially the arm Chinese, this, the name is very interesting. The enlarging name, it means one guy from China. Uh, I and all my group like the name very much. The bug is very strong, just uh, as strong as the bug in the in the American continent. The Hodisus Matthew. Mercury winters, it uh, looks the same. They are in the same family pentatomidae. Next, thank you. In fact, we had done much work on the bugs, arm tennis, before the fall army warmer coming. So it's a good chance to do something. Thank you, next. So far, we got the detailed information for the arm Chinese, which distributed chiefly in the East Asia. Thank you. Next. Yes, um, we can. I think we can find the bugs almost China and in Japan, in Korea, maybe in Mongolia. Next. Thank you. Um, when we got the information, we don't, uh, in fact, we don't know much about whether or not he can control the for army warmer. So, and uh, we want to use the use the date of the the stinger bug from the American continent, and at the same time, we began the, our experiments indoors. According to our experiments, we found both arm Chinese and Picromorus lovers, uh, the two sting bugs, like to seek for arm warmer lovers, especially the, uh, the old lovers. They both, the two sting bugs, had a remarkable con control effect to the worms, especially the large one. Next, thank you. Yeah, yeah. The next, thank you. After that, we needed to do more job on the mass rearing. Thank you. Next. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And then about the massive rearing of the arm Chinese. In fact, we 10 years ago, we had begun the work on the artificial diet for the bugs. Mm, at that time, the Dr. Hong Yin Chen led the job. All my group joined the job. So far, we really live with the artificial in that, artificial deaths and sometimes with the natural enemy praise. Next, thank you. 
The prey is another armyworm. Looks like the whole armyworm. Of course, we spend much time on the research about the massive rearing of the prey. Thank you. Next. About the artificial diet of arm Chinese, we find the effect of different sterile. Different sterile levels in artificial in diet may affect the develop of the arm of our bugs on its weight of navies. Next, thank you. And on the development duration and the weight of and the lifetime of the navies. And the egg hedging. Next, next. Thank you. Next. Right. Thank you. Next. Next. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Next. The divergent, divergent levels of sterile have the effect on the agar uh, agar hatching agar hatching and hatching duration and the um, hatching rate next in our year world we find the sterile significantly affect the development next thank you the effect of the developing duration for the nephew but almost had no effect on the lifetime and the reproduction. It means the sterile levels, different sterile levels of artificial that almost had no effect on the adults. Thank you, next. Compare with the artificial death and the natural prey, we make the comparison of succeed who feed on the 12th generation, especially for the generation six, nine, and 12, because as, the, as we know, the bugs, one generation need at least uh, one month, sometimes more than 40 days. So the 12th generation sometimes means four year or one and a half year. Next, thank you. The next three pictures just will show the difference between natural prey and artificial diet have the almost no difference about the eggers and the navis wheat and egg navis body loss and the development time or the means the duration. Thank you, next. Mm -hmm. And the duration, harm. Right, thank you. Next. Mm -hmm. After all this job, we so far have designed the, began to the produce the massive rearing produce the produce land. So far, we have designed the produce land two lines and uh, do some job on the environmental parameters. Next, thank you. So far, we have two factory, factories in South China, Fuzhou province, and next. Thank you. And the Hebei province, in the Longfang city, we have another factories. So far, thank you. Next one. Normally, we can get 40, no, 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 70 million per year. We at the same time supply the, the usage for million more every year. Thank you, next. And the next research will focus on the, about the field practice, the, pro, the product, had been used on vegetables, next, thank you, tobaccos, and in some gardens. 
so far has been used in South China and uh, many South, many North China provinces. Next, thank you. And the next research we will focus on the effect of the bug in agriculture system. It means how to use use the the bugs in the in the open open field. Next, thank you. Here is the tobacco in the in the tobacco field. And the next, thank you. In the last uh, three years. Next, thank you. During the job, we got many, many help from every level leaders and friends. So many thanks. And of course, our fair level leaders hope we can do more for the bell control in the future. Of course, we hope so. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for attention. Happy New Year. Thank you. Alison, is everything okay? You're on mute. Yeah. Yes, thank you for reminding me, <laughs> Pranav. Thank you so much uh, for that presentation and uh, Happy New Year to everyone and also Happy Chinese New Year. Uh, it's a very busy time in this part of the world. Uh, and so we've got one more uh, session coming up in January and then we will take a break all February uh, because we know people will be celebrating the Chinese New Year. Thank you so much for that, that presentation. Um, I have lots of questions. I'm just going to bring the question um, Q&A sheet up. Uh, and I've got a quick question for you. Um, that rearing facility looked quite substantial and quite um, impressive. I mean, how, how not to be exact about it, but how much um, f funding does this kind of require to get something like mm -hmm. this up and running? Is, is it exp very expensive or can it be done uh, quite cheaply? What's your opinion on that, Ms. Wong? Mm. <laughs> Sorry, it means how how much about me? You means how yeah. we can find? Is it a, is it expensive to set up this program? Does it cost a lot to set up such a program? Oh, you mean the cost? Yeah. Mm, at first, it cost a lot. We need at first we need to uh, feed the sting bugs with natural enemy uh, prey, natural a natural prey. So when put much time on the massive rearing of the natural prey. It's yep. another army woman. Yes, yep. almost uh, one or two years. One or two years. No, that's, mm -hmm. that's really in the, impressive. In the, in the massive rearing, the, the natural prey, yes. Yeah. Um, now I've got a question here. Uh, I think you've answered some of this, but but uh, somebody from, and I've just lost it on my screen. Uh, here's an entomologist from Lao PDR. Yeah. We promote Lao's farm, mm -hmm. uh, farmer mm -hmm. to use stink bug. So they, they promote the use of stink bugs uh, to farmers in, in Laos uh, as a method to control fall army worm. Uh, and I've just lost it again. Mm. Is that, think, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah. sorry, you, I keep losing the question it's, and, I, and I'm sorry for this, everyone. Um, uh, yes, in the, in the family of the Pantitomidae, yes. uh, there are more, but more 40, more 4,000, 4, more than 4,000 species. Ah. But uh, mm, I mean, there are, Many many species of the sting bugs. One subfamily is the predators. It means in the subfamily, all the species is predators. And in this year in South China, as near the Laos, we find other sting bugs. I think uh, 
um, maybe different area, we can find the different species. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, so I think, do you think there is potential, therefore, to look at what's already in Southeast Asia, for example, and then look at what you are doing in China and, and somehow collaborate on, on some of that mass rearing and research? There would be potential there to, to learn a lot from your, from your work in China. What, what, what do you think is one of the biggest challenges uh, in your next research efforts? You, you, mentioned, you mentioned you were now looking at uh, release in the field, for example, and improving that part uh, of this process. What do you think will be a big challenge oh. in the future? In fact, in this, in the last year, 2020, the, the biggest uh, challenges for us is uh, the principle. Uh, it means we, uh, we produce the thing back in Beijing city. How we can transfer from Beijing to other province, the, the procedure is a little hard so far. Ah, that's, and, and why is it hard? Because it's difficult to, to for the travel to, to send them or how how do you do that? Oh, dear, dear, we we have we had we had many tries. Mm -hmm. dear, during the transfer, many many mm, uh, one eat one another. They they will eat uh, uh, each other. And the ah, okay. so we can we maybe we find mm -hmm, we need to do more job about the um, condition means the temperature humidity. So far, we are we are doing this kind of job. Okay, no, that's a good point. Um, so you you have the two uh, the two bugs that you talked about today, or the one sorry. At what other uh, natural enemies are you rearing for fall armyworm? Oh, in my PPT, I, I showed the another species is uh, looks like the fall armyworm. It's uh, the mm -hmm, Picromorus lobis. We find the species just, uh, just three years ago. Okay. You mean this is the, the replacement for the fall army women or to, for the feed, or is this another mm. other natural enemies of mm. fall army worm are you rearing? Oh, so far we we are doing the massive rearing at the same time, the two species okay. at the same time, right? Uh, of course, maybe we can find more species. Who knows? Who knows? Okay. Do you think uh, uh, somebody has asked a question here? Are there any easier ways of mass rearing this predator that are less cost? That would be less cost or lower cost. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good question. We talk this many, many times. <laughs> mm. In uh, fact, uh, we are trying, but uh, so far not uh, not so good. Uh, it means uh, so far have no so um, so many good 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 ways. Okay. Um, excellent. And so, uh, do you have do you have any early? And, and this is the last question. Do you have any early results in the field of how effective this this? Your maize uh, predator is in the field in maize fields. Do you do you know have, have have you got any early results on the effectiveness when applied in the field? You mean the the sting bug used yes. in the field? Yes, yes, oh. the pre armor shenensis. How how what are your early results from application in the field in maize fields? Oh, uh, in the 
in my PPT, we talk about in the tobacco field. In okay. fact, in the Guizhou province, the tobacco field is mixture, mi mixed with the music field. Ah, okay. That's mm -hmm. good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Great, excellent. Thank you so much. And uh, once again, I'm just so impressed about the, the level of effort uh, and the level of uh, investment uh, that China is uh, and CAS Institute of Plant Protection, yourself and your and all your colleagues are putting into uh, the, all the different approaches to control fall armyworms. So it's a pleasure to have you join us and thank you so much for presenting today. It was a very good presentation. I, I really enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And now I'd like to move on to our, just a quick summary. It's, our, it's just our last part of today's session. After that, we'll close. We've set a time for 11.45 today because we knew we had three uh, very extensive uh, presentations. So I would like to just welcome Dr. Feng Zhang from Kabi, uh, or Kabi, sorry. <laughs> uh, look, welcome, welcome, uh, uh, Feng. Th thank you so much for, um, coming here today and listening through and and it's great to have you on board again uh, and Cabby as part of this process and a few thoughts from you would be most welcome. Okay, uh, thank you Alison. Uh, on behalf of Cabby, I would also like to express our sincere thanks uh, to all the speakers uh, for their excellent presentations and sharing the knowledge without reservations. Uh, from today's presentation, I can clearly see uh, that biological control uh, of four army war uh, with natural enemies have a huge potential uh, thanks to the rain techniques that has been de uh, let's say developed, uh, of course, present today uh, by all the speakers. Uh, but I also see the observations from the questions that certain concerns from the uh, participants uh, to question on the quality uh, and also uh, that we, we must consider when when we go from small scale rain uh, to large scale rain, I think the rain will be get a little bit tricky. Uh, we, have to, we, have to, uh, we have to not compromise between the uh, quantities. At the same time, we, we, have, we must produce uh, high qualified, I think, products that to meet the, uh, meet the farmers' needs. Uh, otherwise, this might be deteriorated our effort in biological control. Uh, based on my own experience, I've been working in Laos and Myanmar uh, with the PPC and the PPD, their colleagues there. Uh, I see their strong needs uh, to transfer the knowledge of ballot control uh, to the country in the region and to establish local production facilities. Uh, during this process, I think we must consider the local conditions, how to adapt uh, the techniques uh, in each country. Uh, that, that means that uh, we should, we should uh, try to, uh, to work with them together uh, uh, as a bottom-up or top-down approach to have an integrated approach together. Uh, so uh, with that, I think we have to admit that uh, the uptake of biological control uh, is still limited uh, in this region. Uh, I think the limitation uh, is might attributed to a number of the factors uh, like economic aspects, social aspects, or even technical difficulties uh, handled at different levels. Uh, of course, some of the research have been shown that the major barriers for biological control is really the lack of knowledge uh, and also like uh, the cost uh, has been mentioned already uh, and also how compatibility of the technology with other control measures such as chemical control. And of course, uh, I believe that more capacity building and the training uh, of the extension staff and the members and the farmers that we, uh, that we have more, uh, let's say, awareness raising activities uh, through technology innovation uh, in the digital area, we might have found the new ways of doing things. Uh, that would help us to overcome these barriers, really adopt the budget control uh, in a more uh, sustainable way. Uh, as Moody, I think, mentioned in his introduction, showed the structure that, that say that uh, we can make a change if we can adopt ways of doing things uh, to, uh, to foster the uptake of biological control. Uh, again, uh, I believe we need to, uh, to take a more, let's say, a participatory and the integrated approach 
uh, to uh, get all the stakeholders involved, uh, not only researchers, but also uh, farmers, extension officers, and even policy makers. Uh, so we need support uh, to really, and also to need to work together uh, in this process uh, to really, uh, let's see, uh, uh, to promote, uh, to get body control effect, efficient and effective uh, in the field. So with that, I, that's my uh, short summary. Uh, I will hand over it back to Alison. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to me. Uh, thank you so much for that uh, conclusion. That was extremely well done. I think it pulled together all the key points, but also talked about that need to, to work together. Um, uh, so extremely, extremely good way to end. So thank you, uh, Fang. Uh, very well um, appreciated and received. Um, and that's it for us today. All I want to do is just end by saying a big thank you to everyone, all our wonderful speakers, uh, brilliant uh, presentations as per normal of the series. Thank you to uh, all of you who joined us. Just remember that we still have lots uh, coming up. Some of the things that uh, we discussed today will probably be discussed next uh, session on the 28th January when we're looking about selection and release of parasitoids and predators. We'll be looking at biopesticides, farmer acceptance, uh, design tips for conservation biocontrol, uh, and all sorts of interesting things there as part of that biocontrol journey um, and very much what we heard just in the conclusion there, that need to work together and look at how we can do this together uh, and really uh, integrate biocontrol as part of our IPM uh, strategies. And that is it. So thank you for another wonderful session and safe journeys everyone um, and uh, take it take it easy but also have fun over the next month and we'll see you back uh, in the last week of January. Goodbye.